Hello and welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this program, which is designed to give all of us a little more insight into what goes on in and around our capital and what happens with the folks who are involved in that capital, meaning the governmental process. Our guest today is someone who is intricately aware of, completely aware of, what goes on in terms of the intricacies of government, Phil Kiesling, our Secretary of State. Welcome. Well, thank you for the chance to be here, Kevin. Well, you always have a lot of interesting things to say besides uh, just the, the, the specifics of the Secretary of State office, so it's always a pleasure to, to have you on a show like this. But before we jump into talking about government and the like, I always like to give our, our audience a chance to know a little bit more yeah. about you as a person. Can you just Great. give us, I know we've done yeah. this before, but a little sketch about your background. Yeah, I, I, I grew up out in uh, Washington County, the Beaverton area. Uh, there was about 90,000 people in Washington County when I was born in 1955. I think there's four times as many there. I grew up doing things like picking strawberries and picking beans in the summer and many of those uh, uh, bean and strawberry fields are now high-tech companies and the like. And my dad worked at Tektronix. I spent a couple summers working there as well. Uh, went to Sunset High School, uh, went back east uh, to Yale to go to college and then came back to Oregon. Uh, served briefly as a speechwriter, organizer, staff person for Tom McCall when he ran for governor in 1978 after being out of office for four years. He, he actually failed in that, but it was a, a great experience to work with him. I went into journalism, worked at Willamette Week for three, four years, uh, went back to east to the Washington Monthly magazine uh, in the early 1980s and covered uh, national politics and, and journalism. And then came back to Oregon uh, in the mid-1980s and got a job working for the legislature as an assistant to the Speaker of the House, uh, Vera Katz, who's now mayor of Portland. Did that for about three years and then in 1988, in the same year that uh, you ran for the legislature, uh, I ran as well and got elected to, from a district in southeast and, and southwest Portland. Uh, served just one term in 1989 and then was appointed Secretary of State uh, in 1991 when a, a vacancy came up. Barbara Roberts had been elected governor and, and, and I was appointed. And then uh, ran in my own right in 1992 and was elected and have uh, served as Secretary of State now a little bit over uh, uh, five years. And you are a declared and filed candidate for re-election. I'm a declared and filed candidate and, and uh, that will of course be taking uh, some of my time in addition to the job and also uh, uh, my wife, Pam Wiley, and I have uh, two small children. Ben is going to be five uh, uh, very soon, and Katie's uh, three and a half. So they keep us pretty busy, too, between politics and, uh, and the job and, and the life. Well, you'll have about a little less than a year left in this term, and then you're allowed one more term under term limits? Right. In fact, there's always been term limits for the Secretary of State uh, from the beginning. And uh, uh, I'm a, the term limit law in the Constitution allows two full terms plus part of, a, part of another. Uh, though that actually will change for the future as well. I'd, I'd be the last Secretary of State to be able to serve two terms plus, plus part of another one. Because under the new term limits uh, provisions, even if you serve part of a term or Right, more it counts as a full term. That's right. Well, um, someday we'll, uh, we'll talk again about term limits. It's not as immediate an issue right mm -hmm. now since it's, it's there and it's established both for the state as well as for the, uh, the federal side. But in terms of the electoral process, uh, you run the, uh, the whole elections division for the Secretary of State's office, and that raises a, a number of issues that we'll want to discuss mm -hmm. during the program. Before we get to that, though, I want to take a step back into the past. Uh, I haven't asked you much about what your experiences were like working for Willamette Week and whether how you might compare that to the Willamette Week of today. Oh, that's an interesting question. Of course, Willamette Week, like uh, other publications, and unlike uh, much of the rest of, of journalism is pretty explicit about having a point of view. Articles are written deliberately with a point of view rather than than trying to suggest that this is objective and, and there's no uh, uh, nothing of the sort there. And uh, someone once likened working for Willamette Week is being like going into battles after they'd already been fought and shooting all the survivors that uh, were left. It was journalism that had an edge to it and a point of view. And I enjoyed it a lot. It was a, a great experience. Back when I did it from 1978 to, to 81, articles were a good deal more lengthy and a good deal more in-depth. I, for example, did a couple of, of three-part series, even a six-part series at one point. I covered the legislature uh, pretty full-time in two of the sessions I was there. The Lama Week now doesn't cover the legislature, and its, its format has changed. They don't have quite the in-depth articles, although just last week there was an article on the front cover about agricultural subsidies and who gets them uh, 
who live right here in, in Oregon, including some people who do pretty well financially without uh, any kind of farm subsidies. And I thought it was a real good article, the kind of journalism I think there's too little of that kind of asks and raise some tough questions and is not afraid to uh, put forward uh, issues that need to have discussion. And uh, uh, I enjoyed working there. It didn't challenge my thinking, though, as much as the Washington Monthly. I mean, the Willamette Week is generally, it, particularly back then, you could pretty much predict the point of view from the subject taken. It was pretty much uh, traditional democratic, uh, liberal uh, philosophy. When I went back to work at the Washington Monthly in Washington, D.C., there's was also journalism with a point of view but uh, much more explicitly designed to challenge the conventional wisdom of both left and right, and particularly of the left. And so I, for example, got myself in some hot water very shortly after arriving at the Washington Monthly, at least with some groups, by writing an article that was critical of, of uh, uh, teachers' unions and, and teachers who were not good teachers and incompetent, and also criticizing schools of education. I didn't come out for vouchers. I criticized that too. So conservatives didn't like it, but uh, um, and I'm also that got me uh, it got me some notoriety outside of even the Washington Monthly circle. So that was probably the most important journalistic experience of my own life was going at the Washington Monthly and and asking tough questions of of all sides because I think there's too little of that in our politics. There's an automatic tendency to line up with people who tend to support you and most other things and not question. Uh, where they are and also an automatic tendency to criticize people who often are lined up against you, but uh, wisdom is where you find it and often people don't look hard enough uh, for it. Well, in terms of asking tough questions and looking at uh, both sides and that sort of thing, you're running the elections division now. You've had the challenge of term limits coming in. Uh, we have uh, had some discussion in terms of a particular candidates about their residency and, mm -hmm. and electoral requirements. Mm -hmm. Then we have Measure 9 and campaign finance reform um, uh, of some sort, depending on uh, one person's reform is another person's uh, draconian change. Sure. Um, how do you feel about the work you've done thus far in the Secretary of State's office, and what tough questions would you ask yourself about the electoral process? If, if, if I were, if you were, if we were switching you want me to do, here, you want me to do your job here, Yeah, Kevin. I want you to ask yourself some tough questions about the elections division and where Oregon is going with mail balloting, right. that sort of thing. In fact, I'd, I think you should focus perhaps on campaign finance reform and mail balloting, which are the two hot topics. Well, and, and that's a good lead-in because I think that the changes that are coming in Oregon's election system uh, over the next uh, year or two uh, are going to be the most significant we've probably seen in a generation. Now, I've actually been very supportive of both the things that you mentioned, uh, campaign finance reform and voting by mail. <coughs> um, let's talk about vote by mail first. Uh, vote by mail is, in effect, already here. So many people vote in absentee ballots. In fact, here in Marion County, 60% of all the voters uh, are slated to get absentee ballots for the May 21st election, the primary election, and that's a polling place election uh, by law. We're going to have more people vote through the mail anyway uh, than at the polling place in Marion County, and uh, that trend is just going to accelerate around the state. Uh, I think vote by mail is a, uh, is a way to enfranchise people to make sure that we recognize that lives have changed dramatically in the last few uh, decades, people are busier than ever. Uh, Well-motivated, thoughtful voters often run afoul of soccer practice, working late, kids in school, um, uh, weather. Uh, we've certainly had our dose of that uh, over the last couple months. And that uh, vote by mail empowers people with what is their right to vote. And the turnout and the dramatic increases we've seen in that, I think, are, are speak volumes about what it does for a process. And I think it's important to get as many people engaged and involved, not just because turnout is better for turnout's sake, because it's not, but because the more people you have involved, the more accountable they are then for whatever decisions are made. They're part of the process. They can't escape responsibility for it. And it is a mutual obligation in a democracy between elected officials and, and who elects them uh, to make sure that we have the, the most responsive, accountable government. What about the question of the level of motivation of the voter in this process? That is, are the voters motivated to be informed and involved, 
or is it just going to be so easy that you just fill out this ballot and drop it in the mail, same as paying your electric bill? Yeah. Well, first of all, paying your electric bill and voting are two fundamentally different things. Uh, one is that you owe somebody money. The other is you're the boss. Let's not forget that the very basic premise of our democracy is it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, doesn't matter if you live in the country or in the city, doesn't matter if you're a CEO or a homeless person, doesn't matter whether you're 18 years old or, or 108. Each and every individual has the identical voice in our democracy if they choose to exercise it. Now, this notion that people who vote by mail are somehow not motivated to vote is an absurdity. You have to be motivated to vote. Uh, in fact, some of the critics of vote by mail don't like it because they say it's too complicated and people can't, un you know, they got to work through everything, open the envelope, sign it, and all that. I think that's a silly argument. But if you don't want to vote, you just simply don't return your ballot. Now let me ask vote you. by mail rather removes an obstacle to voting that thwarts an increasing number of thoughtful, motivating people. When you stop and think about it, the mechanics of voting haven't changed in a century. We still insist, in effect, that people show up at a particular physical location away from their homes during a fixed number of hours in the middle of a work week, in the middle of a school year. And with more single parents, more double parents with two or maybe even three jobs between them, people working for themselves, uh, uh, unexpected things come up, just moving around in our, our current society, that's more and more an obstacle to thoughtful people. And the surveys that have been done comparing who votes by mail versus who votes at the polling place show that there's very little difference between them and their knowledge and in their expressed motivation. In fact, one study showed that people more say they're more interested in, in politics, uh, vote by mail only. Um, uh, those are motivated voters. Now, let me ask you, though. In third world countries, do you, they still run elections several days in sequence. Mm -hmm. um, over so. time, I don't know if in Oregon we ever did that because of the lack of transportation or if we expected people to show up even in covered wagon days at a particular place and for a particular time frame. Um, if we're talking about accessibility to the ballot, separate from the vote by mail issue, um, what about moving elections to holidays or to Sundays? Well, I'm still waiting. <laughs> you know, if the Congress of the United States wants to move uh, elections to Saturday and, and Sundays and, and, and do all that, well, as I said, I'm still waiting. There was, we, there we, was we a can, time, We can continue fact, to wait. There but, was a uh, time, in fact, when Election Day was considered a quasi-holiday by right. many folks, that that was the day set aside for purposes of traveling to the polls, and we don't seem to have that anymore. Well, and, and, it's, and it's not. And I understand the community ritual of voting. I'll miss that. I, I really will. I like taking my four or my three-year-old down to the school and casting a ballot. You kind of feel part of that. But, you know, I think we've got to be careful not to confuse a particular mechanic of democracy with what its essence is. The essence of democracy isn't the standing in line and casting a ballot. That's the form that it may take for it's people. the thinking and acting. The thinking, the acting, the discussion you have ahead of time. And we obviously have real problems with that. We need to do a lot better job educating people. I'm appalled at the ignorance, and it starts with our young people, but it goes all the way through our adults about the basics of the civics process. It's not just knowing the name of your congresspeople. Actually, most motivated voters don't know that now. But even more importantly, how bills become law, how you lobby a legislator, how you, the role that you play in this, in this larger uh, democratic society. But let's address the root of that. Let's not pretend that we're going to make these great inroads and, and we will you know, have this bulwark of defense by insisting on clinging to a century-old mechanic of, of how we actually cast the ballot. Let me ask you some more questions about that. If this were Illinois, Mm -hmm. And our capital was, uh, well, if, if this were Illinois and we were dealing with Illinois top politics, would you be advocating vote by mail? You know, I would, because I've gotten to understand what makes vote by mail work. And I didn't really understand that when I was in the legislature. In fact, when I voted against a vote by mail bill in 1989. Each and every signature on a vote by mail envelope is checked against the original that's in the county courthouse. That is not a protection and safeguard that is in place with the polling place election. In fact, Priscilla Southwell, who's a professor of political science at the University of Oregon, is actually supportive of vote by mail, in part because she recalls growing up in Chicago and having her father go to the polling place one afternoon and was informed that he'd already voted. Well, he hadn't. Someone had impersonated him and maybe in collusion with the election board workers. 
Uh, but uh, he was finally allowed to vote, but there was no way to retrieve the ersatz ballot that, that came in. And, you know, fraud is always a potential problem in any election system. But the protection and safeguards we've built in, in Oregon, I think, have worked time and time again. Well, I want you to understand the, the distinction I was making is I think Oregon has got very honest politics. Right. And, uh, Chicago and the, and the whole state of Illinois still have what, by my standards, are questionable policies. But what's the dishonesty is the issue. I mean, when you stop and think about how you, if you want to commit vote fraud, and if there's an atmosphere to allow you to do it, you don't do it by going around and risking, if you get caught one time, a felony conviction, vote by vote by vote by vote by vote. I mean, election fraud, if you go through American history and look at uh, what's been successful, what people have tried, have usually involved fraud through centralized systems you rig the ballot counting machines you rig the you know the with 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 the registrars in cahoots to let ghost people end up voting and it's that level of fraud and that's not a vote by mail versus a polling place issue that's much deeper and, and much more systematic. And there's a further answer for Oregonians, which is, well, we don't have to design the system for Illinois. We're designing a system for Oregon, and let's deal with our system and let them argue out their own problems in their communities. But why not we do it right for ourselves, which is and what you're talking right. about. And, and we have proven it over and over again. In fact, this last presidential primary was fascinating to me. It was a snooze. I mean, my goodness. Bob Dole came out here for half a day. That was it. Won a single TV ad, won a single radio ad. I never got a flyer. We had a higher turnout than any other state that has held a presidential primary up to this date, the highest. And it was a mail ballot. It was a mail ballot. I shudder to think what it would have been if it had been a polling place election, but in many other states the turnout was all a 20 or 30 percent. And this is, of course, for choosing a nominee who could be the next president of the United States. Let's pause for a moment. I'll mention to our audience that you're with us on Capital Insight. I'm Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this program. Our guest today is our Secretary of State, Phil Kiesling. We've been talking about elections. We'll be talking about a lot more in a moment. But I wanted to let you know, if you ever have any questions or concerns, you should feel free to write to me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. We're always happy to hear from you. Well, turning back to our guest, Phil Kiesling, uh, I don't want to get us too hung up on vote by mail because there's so much more going on that you're involved in. And, uh, and, and let's talk about campaign finance okay. reform yeah. and the non-reforms by the legislature over the years as opposed to Measure 9, which is a very draconian reform in the view of many. Uh, but also it brought about some necessary change when the political leaders weren't willing to do something. And that's Tell a very us a good, little about That's it. a very good point. You know, between 1975 and 19, uh, uh, you know, 94, stretch of 10 legislative sessions, uh, there was absolutely no significant legislation enacted on campaign finance reform. Voters uh, told people in polls and other ways that the issue mattered to them. Races were rapidly escalating and cost a tenfold increase in what it took on average to run for the legislature and particularly open seats where the incumbent uh, left or decided not to run again. Uh, seats going for $100,000, $150,000 to, to win it, wage a successful campaign. And yet there was a kind of a charade that went on. Uh, both Democrats and Republicans controlled various chambers during that time. And it was almost as if uh, both sides agreed that they would posture on campaign finance reform. Yes, it's a problem. Yes, we should try to do something. But work to guarantee that in the end nothing ever came out of, of the legislature. And of course, uh, people who ran and, and won by the old rules uh, uh, kept the old rules in place. Voters finally rebelled and, and did so very strongly. Measure 9 got on the ballot. It passed in every single county in Oregon, the only initiative that did. And we went from having no limits at all, being one of the few states where you could give literally a million dollars to someone running for the legislature or statewide office, to a state with now some of the strictest contribution limits in place. Only $100 for a legislative candidate, 500 for a statewide candidate. Uh, uh, PACs limited the same amount, and no corporate or labor union contributions, which is actually the rule that's been in place at the federal level for quite some time. So the ball game has changed profoundly with campaign finance reform. Now you feel pretty good about this. Well, I supported it. I, I'd gotten to the point, it, wasn't, it was stricter than the bills I had introduced, but at a certain point, if the legislature doesn't do anything, the people hit them across the head with a two-by-four and went say, on camera, listen up, uh, we need to do something. 
Now, doesn't that make you feel good about the populist initiative process? Well, I actually, I actually have been a supporter of the initiative process, uh, uh, Kevin. I've, I've been more sympathetic to it than, 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 than many. I think it needs some changes. Uh, and I've, I've particularly targeted the role of, of the, the paid signature gathering with the bounty method and the constitutional amendment aspect of it. Uh, and I think we're too quick to amend the Constitution, and we ought to be focusing our energy more on statutory changes. Um, but Measure 9 is actually perhaps one of, if not the best example from the last cycle, of why you need an initiative process. Because here's legislators, all of whom got there by the old rules, ignoring the clamor from the public to change those rules, and finally the public rising up after 10 sessions of inaction and, and enacting something. Now, a lot of people now think that it's, it's, it's too harsh, the limits are too strict. Um, but they can always revisit that uh, because mm -hmm. it's statutory. Exactly. And I think if you give it a chance to work, and we'll see what kind of changes occur. A lot of people said, oh, people aren't going to run for office now because these limits are too strict. Well, we just got done with filing day, and practically the same number of people filed for the various offices as did in the, in the previous cycle. Although this isn't a campaign program, you and I are both running. Do we happen to both <laughs> be on the ballot? And, uh, and I actually have no problem abiding by the limits. In fact, when I ran in 1992, I almost out of necessity had to raise money from a lot of different people. I raised money, I think, from about 2,000 individuals when I ran for Secretary of State in 1992. And that's what the premium is going to be placed on. What, it, what, what Measure 9 does is it, uh, on a fundamental level is that under the old system, you could gain the money you needed to get your message out to voters in a reasonable way by going to a relative handful of political action committees and maybe very large donors that could give a lot of money. And if you got their support, that would translate into being able to run a, a campaign. Uh, today, you can't. You instead have to build a much broader base of individuals, do it $50, $100 at a time, rather than $5,000, $10,000, $25,000 uh, at a time. And that will change how candidates uh, conduct their campaigns and how they raise money. but. I think, quite honestly, that that's to the better on balance. I, and I guess we'll have a chance to try that all out because there won't be any change in Measure 9 immediately. We will have it unless the, the courts prior. unless the courts rule otherwise. Um, unless, there is a court challenge right. pending. That's true. Right. But right now, for the primary season and perhaps for the general election this year, Measure 9 will be in place again unless the courts do something. To right. It. And that being the case, we'll have a chance to see how it has affected the campaign methodology. From a personal perspective, I'd mention that in running for attorney general, I'm spending literally three to four hours on the phone every day calling people for money. Um, what frustrates me a little about that is uh, I would rather be out giving a speech to a community organization about issues, and instead I'm calling and calling and calling saying, can you send $100, can you send $200? Um, there is a, there's a balance point there. Uh, I guess candidates are always raising money at one point. And I note that Peter DeFazio was concerned about how much time he'd have right. to spend asking for money as opposed to, to campaigning. campaigning. But that, doesn't that bring up the question of the voters' pamphlet as one of the best tools for reaching the voters? And maybe there ought to be other government-sponsored ways to assist candidates in reaching the public. Like, and I'm just making up ideas here, a video voters yep. pamphlet. It's something actually that I've had some discussions with people about and like to, like to push. We have a voters pamphlet right now that costs a lot of money. It is heavily subsidized by taxpayers, a couple million dollars uh, for an election cycle. We are about the only state that allows unlimited numbers of measure arguments. We had 244 last cycle among the 18 measures that were there. And at $500 a pop, the charge is only a, a fraction, maybe a fifth, of what it actually costs. So we're subsidizing that unlimited access. I've proposed, and I was unsuccessful last time, we'll continue to do it, is to, is to have one argument per each side with a rebuttal, and then look at the savings that are created and start using that to put into putting it on the internet, doing video voter pamphlet, you can do video text now through the internet, and working, let's say, with cable television stations to do an electronic version of it. Uh, because more and more people get their information that way. And I think you'd have more value for the same amount of money uh, by, by changing some of those rules. I don't think you can get extra money. The budget's pretty tight. But I think you can take the same amount of money and even less and get a lot more oomph for it and educate a lot more people. You know, a lot of people get most of their information now through electronic means rather than, than written means. And uh, you can say that's a good or a bad thing, but that's the reality. 
The hard part about limiting measure arguments is determining how you limit those measure arguments. Well, the proponent one's easy. You just let the proponents, uh, uh, you know, uh, say you get this much space, that's it, and you get to you get to write it. Uh, on on the opponent side, it's a little tougher. Someone would have to make an appointment, and you'd have a process for making sure that that was on the up and up. But you know, we have some of that now. Other states, that's how they've done it. They've we do it for the explanatory do it. statement. We do it for already. the explanatory statement. And then, if people want to add additional arguments, there's nothing to prevent them from going into the private marketplace and teaming up and and, and doing that, and and putting it out. I also think the role that the television and electronic media can, can play uh, at the national level, for example, I like the idea of having, let's say in the presidential campaign, to try to minimize, reduce the role that these 30-second pre-produced commercials have and instead do what a lot of European countries do, provide fixed amounts of airtime. Could you imagine five minutes for the Republican nominee, the Democratic nominee, and any other nominee that they get on a rotating basis in the last month of the campaign, maybe at the same time, that they have start having a dialogue with, with Americans in that kind of format so it's not just the TV commercials. How about the same? Oregon could uh, take the lead at the state level. Could you it? bet. We can't, we don't have the leverage over the, the uh, licensees, the broadcast licensees that the, that the Federal Communications Commission has, because that's regulated at the federal level, but certainly on a voluntary basis. And uh, I know a lot of the cable companies have been, uh, actually, I think, done a real service by having shows like this, having shows that are, in effect, the functional equivalent of electronic voters' pamphlet that they play over and over again during election season. I'd like to see a lot more of that and, and, and like to work with them to do that. As a curiosity, have you had very many individual candidates who filed measure statements for the spring voters' pamphlet? Do you know, I haven't checked. I haven't checked. On I would that. worry a little bit because uh, some people might use that space to proselytize their own message rather than to really address the measure. And that's a good point because, in fact, we already have the problem of mischief. Some people will recall Measure 13 last time. There was a yes on that. That was the OCA measure that uh, many thought was very tongue in cheek. It was vote for this and let's. I I implement the entire book of Leviticus uh, as well. And I got a lot of protests from people who supported 13 and said, how dare you put that under the yes on 13? And I said, it's the law. You know, I don't have any legal authority to do a tongue-in-cheek test for what is submitted. And in fact, voters need to beware. Uh, with the exception of the required information for candidates, there is no truth screen on what gets into the voters pamphlet, the optional information the candidates give, the measure argument information. And as you allow unlimited numbers of arguments, the potential increase is that people are going to try to get around the l spirit of the voters pamphlet by doing things that, while perfectly legal, will, will in effect undercut the credibility of the document. And that concerns me a lot. Because it, when people start trusting it less and less, I think it really loses one of its purposes. Well, then we'll need to be ever vigilant about that. We've only got about a minute to go, and I just ask you if you have any any particular direction that we haven't talked about that you. Yeah, there's one I really want to talk about. It's time that Oregon shows some leadership uh, about independence. Uh, we've shown leadership on vote by mail and the initiative, other things, campaign finance reform, even. I've, uh, I've, I've urged both political parties to open their primaries now to independent voters. Not to the people in the other parties, but to the 360,000 independents. There are 20% of our registered voters, double what the proportion was just five years ago. Uh, I think it's time to have the parties let them in, and if their message is strong and good enough, they're going to join that party. Uh, but to stop insisting that they have to be members of the church to come in and participate and listen to the sermon. And uh, we pay, all taxpayers pay, for party primary elections, including the elections of precinct committee people. And I think it's time that uh, we make that change and enfranchise those people, and I'll be working hard to do that. Well, there you have it. Phil Kiesling, Secretary of State. Uh, Phil has always been willing to advocate that uh, we take a, a tough look at things and be willing to ask some tough questions, and he's raising some more issues for us for the future. Thank you for joining thank us you. on it. Capital Insight, and thank you to our audience. See you soon.